start our tour, um, I would like to present myself. For those of you that are first time participants to one of our free virtual tours, my name is Georgiana. I uh, have a company it's called Romanian Thrills. I started this company with Vlad, who is my partner and also the person in charge of the chat tonight. Uh, so if you want to address any questions, um, please type them in the chat and he'll let me know and I'll answer directly. We have started doing this virtual tours last Halloween, so last October, and then we've done one virtual tour every month since then. Uh, it's just our way of um, keeping the travel spirit alive, and we also wanted to keep Romania in people's minds on their um, personal bucket list, travel bucket list, or when the time comes and um, hopefully borders open fully, um, we will uh, restart our physical tours once more. So thank you for um, always joining our, our tours. Uh, we have created a small community of people that are uh, genuinely interested in Romania and we can be more thankful for this. And um, this, um, this month actually, uh, we have seen some changes, right? You are aware that people are getting more and more vaccinated. Um, and borders are slowly opening. Unfortunately, not the international border. So I know that uh, people coming from the United States still have some issues coming through. Uh, maybe some the companies have canceled their plans and so on and so forth. So in our opinion, 2021 will not be that fully opened uh, season that we were hoping for, which is why we will continue with our free virtual tours until next Halloween. Um, at least. Um, I know that you haven't seen any new uh, free virtual tours planned. We normally like to plan at least two or three months in advance, but we were kind of waiting to see what the situation will look like, if we can uh, do physical tours or not. Um, it's, it's partially open, so we will continue with the free virtual tours. Tonight we have um, a special region in Romania. We are going to explore the Danube Delta. Uh, so I will ask Vlad to launch a poll because um, this is a very niche um, subject. So it's a type of travel mostly um, for bird watchers um, or for people that enjoy watching wildlife. So I would like to know why, what was your personal um, reason for joining uh, our tour tonight? Well, I have to say, I like what I'm seeing. <laughs> All right, so um, as far as I see, um, a lot of you like us, like Romain, that, that really makes us really happy. That means that what we're doing, our job, has reached its objective, so to say. Um, you, Some of you have said that you want to visit the Danube Delta while in Romania, uh, or just sail down the Danube, and connecting the Danube Delta is such a great way to see both the Danube in other countries and also the, um, um, the diversity of this region. I like bird watching. I like bird watching too. It has become a passion lately. And no one wants to try different cuisines. Don't worry, don't worry. By the end of this tour, your opinion might change. So, um, I will stop this poll right now and we'll start with our tour. As always, you know, I like to put Romania on the map. Um, I know that you already know where Romania is, uh, but for those of you that are first timers, Romania is located in, um, in southern central eastern europe and it's it, bo it borders the black sea to the um, to the east hungary to the west ukraine in the north and bulgaria to bulgaria and serbia to the south and tonight we're going to talk of one of the more um, complex regions in romania and that is 
Do Broja. Do Broja is the fish tail right by the where the Danube flows into the Black Sea. So this is the Black Sea, and these are the branches. And this Danube Delta is actually part of the UNESCO World Heritage. It is the largest wetland of Europe and is home to thousands of animals and vegetation species, which are rare or missing in other parts of Europe. Um, Please notice this map coverage. This is the area that it is considered the Danube Delta. So even though most of the Delta is concentrated here, this piece of land is also the Delta. Uh, so tonight we are going to do our tour just as one of our physical tours because we do offer um, a Danube Delta bird watching tour regularly. And normally during May, just this is the month that we're currently in. That's why we chose this tour um, to do the, the tour right now. And we do it as a group adventure, but of course it can be also a private, a handcrafted private adventure. And during the during our tour, during our seven day tour, you get to explore the Danube Delta. Um, it's best and wildest seen slowly in an uncovered boat. You, you will watch countless species of breeding or migratory birds, and you can enjoy unique fish-based cuisine from the locals. And of course, let's not forget spectacular sunrises and sunsets. Uh, by the way, because we are going to talk about fish a lot, um, do comment in the chat whether fish, <laughs> whether you eat fish or not or if you enjoy fish dishes, um, I will share a little bit of piece of information about myself. I do not like fish that much. But fortunately for me, the fish from the Danube Delta is completely different. I personally don't like the, um, the river fish. Uh, I like the ocean fish because it doesn't have that taste. But do let me know your opinion. I would like to see if there are any other people like me that don't, that have a certain preference of fish or not. So. Uh, Vlad will tell, me, will tell me your answers. So normally the first day of the tour starts in Bucharest, of course, because you arrive at the airport. Second day will be in Machin Mountains. And I know these uh, names won't mean anything to you right now, but this is how the, the tour will lay out. And then you'll know by the end of, the, of this virtual tour what they mean. Day three will be in Tulcha. Day four will be in St. George in the Danube Delta inside the, the Delta. Day five would be Jurilovka, which is a small village also located in the Danube Delta, in Isala. And day seven would be Constanza and back to Bucharest. Just so you understand, I have laid out the itinerary on the map again. So the Danube Delta is right here. We travel from Bucharest, go to Machin Mountains, which are located here. Then Tulcha is the, the town, the port town that I talked to you about, talked to you about. And then we're entering the, um, by a boat ride. I, it was, I couldn't lay out the boat ride through the reservation because Google Maps only thinks in cars. Um, and then we're going down the coast and from Constanza, we're coming back to Eucharist. So as you can see, we're not covering the large part of Romania. That's why a Danube Delta trip, uh, it's not too short, it's not too long, and it can easily be connected with other trips through Romania. So for example, if you want to spend like four or five days in Transylvania and then visit the Danube Delta, that can, uh, that can be an excellent option to cover Romania more. So let's start with our tour. Day first, imagine that you are traveling, that we, um, you have finally decided to come to Romania and travel with us as your guides. So we will come and pick you up at the airport. The first day of a tour is normally reserved just for that transfer from the airport to your hotel. And of course, depending on your flight, we can arrange some activities for those days, but normally it'll be um, just a welcome dinner because you'll probably have some jet lag to get over. Day second, we will start early in the morning and the destination for this day is Machin Mountains. I have a video here. Do let me know if it plays. Okay, yeah. So the Machin, uh, Machin Mountains are not part of the Carpathian range. You, we have talked about in the past about the mountains of Romania, the Carpathians. Um, those are predominant, everyone knows about them, but the Machin Mountains are actually um, little known even to Romanians themselves. They actually are the oldest mountain range that we have in, um, in our country. They have formed around 100 million years before the Carpathians. 
100 million years in the late Paleozoic. So that means um, 250 million years ago. It is thought that they were almost 3,000 meters high, uh, but today they, uh, the highest peak counts only 467 meters. So it's, it's nothing. You can see from this video that they're not very tall. They are completely surrounded by agricultural fields today. But that's because of the erosion that they had to endure for so many mil hundreds of millions of years, right? That's what reduced their current size. Um, it was declared a biosphere reserve in 1998, and it is the only area in the European Union where the specific ecosystems of um, forest steppe meet the Mediterranean and Balkan countries. So actually in Machin Mountains, you can find over 3,400 species of flora and fauna, uh, but also very large areas of just steppe vegetation. As a matter of fact, half of the Romanian flora is found in this area. And this area only covers 0.05% of the surface of our country. And it's home to half of the vegetation of the, of the flora. That's pretty incredible. And it's also half of the avifauna, so half of the birds that come in Romania, um, no matter if they're non-migratory or migratory, also pass through this region. So incredibly biodiverse, um, incredibly important for this reason. And also the uniqueness of the landscape is given by the megalithic granite formations um, and the contrast, the constant contrast between the mountains and the flat area uh, next to it. So uh, one of this granite landmark, um, special granite landmark that we can find here is the Sphinx. Um, it's just a naturally formed um, rock and it looks just like an old man. We call it the old Dobrogen. Dobroja is the name of the region that we talked earlier. And you can see, you, you, you have the eye, you have the nose, you have the mouth, and almost the paw of the sphinx here, right? And uh, in the back. This is its highest peak, Tutsuyatu, Tutsuyatu Peak. Um, as you can see, it looks just like a regular hill, but I have to tell you that was one of, uh, the, most, one of the most beautiful hikes that we have ever taken in Romania. And, um, Another important uh, fact of these mountains are the different habitats that coexist in a, a relatively um, small amount of, of ground. And um, one that exists only here, it's unique to the area, is the Dobrogen Beach Forest. Actually, lots of um, beekeepers in Romania go every summer there um, because it's, a, it's such an amazing area for bees as well, for the um, the polyflower honey, the one that gathers flowers from all sorts of um, flora species. Um, it's incredible. I, I know that they fight over a piece of land there because, you know, beekeepers cannot be too many in, in a single spot. Another, another thing that I wanted to share with you are uh, some very important species that are considered either rare or endangered, and they have a special importance for science and the biodiversity of, these, of the area, which we're trying to, to preserve. So that would be the spur thigh tortoise. Uh, please bear with me. It was um, difficult to find these names in English. They have such a special name in Romanian. And trust me, the translation is nothing like the one in English. This is an endemic species to these mountains. It's a land tortoise. And it's actually really, really cute. Uh, the second one will be the four lime snake. It's a non-venomous snake, but it is the biggest, one of the biggest snakes in Romania. It can grow up to two meters in length. A strictly protected species of bird, that would be the European roller. Beautiful, beautiful feathers, beautiful colors. And the steep polecat as well. It's under strict protection here in Machin Mountains. The Dobrugian falcon, which unfortunately um, has become rarer and as mentioned, endangered. It's slowly losing its habitat. Um, and it happens also due to overpopulation of other species like the jackals, for example. And another, another cute species that I want to mention would be the giant peacock moth. 
who of which is actually one of the biggest moths in Europe with a wingspan of um, 15 to 20 centimeters. That will be something like this. So we, um, at the end of the day, uh, the first day is Machi Mountains, but it's also the travel uh, part from Eucharist, getting from Eucharist to Machin, and then we're doing half of day of hiking uh, through these mountains that we've just spoken, spoken about. The local guide that points out to us all of these. So incredible, an incredible activity for those that are passionate about um, shooting um, or watching birds or watching different species of mammals if they want to. and. In uh, during the evening, we sleep in um, in, a, in a guest house located deep in these mountains. So it's a very isolated and remote location. Just because we need to get ready for the third day, where uh, when we are in Tulcha and we get ready for a boat ride. So Tulcha is actually a port city. was founded in the seventh century. Um, it's located in North Dobroja. And most of the boat rides that go to the Danube Delta, and if you do a day trip, will depart from uh, this specific area. The boat ride that we include in our tour um, is somewhere between eight hours to 10 hours long because it's the whole day. But let's see why it takes so long. Because we use, you might recognize this girl, was a little bit frozen at that time, uh, because we only use slow boats that are open with the guide on the back that will always point along the way uh, all the species of birds and animals that he sees. Uh, it's important for the boat to be like this so that it gives you a full view of everything that you see around you. And it's important to go slow because of course, if you're rushing through the canals, all the birds will fly away. The routes that we normally take through the Delta include a large number of places with concentrations of birds, such as marshland, salty, uh, salty sand islands, forested areas, lakes, or just special places that the guide will know as feeding or roosting spots. Uh, some typical birds that you will see during your boat ride are the pelicans, the great white pelicans, and I want to show you a video. This is uh, how your boat ride would start. So as you see, um, it starts on a wider area of the Danube and straight away you can see a, a big colony of pelicans. All of these white birds that you see flying are pelicans, are the great white pelicans. And I believe the black birds that, we, that you see could probably, I can't tell for sure, they could be cormorants, they could be herons. But this would be the start point of the bow ride. The boat goes a little bit faster in the beginning because there's a lot of ground to cover, but as the moment that the canals start to narrow down, you will go much, much slower. So let's see what other species of birds, and I chose my personal favorites because the Danube Delta is home to more than 300 types of birds, so I, could, I couldn't have included them uh, all tonight. Um, but, but one of the cutest one would have to be this Quacko Heron. I really, really like it, uh, its colors and the beak. He's an excellent fisher, fisherman, fisher bird. <laughs> Um, the Dalmatian pelican, which is easily confused with the great white pelican, but the difference would have to be in its mane. It normally curls up, curls up a little bit during roosting periods. And he, um, he um, fishes differently than the great white. This is also a Dalmatian pelican caught with the poor fish in its beak. The great white pelicans that we saw at the beginning the coming and kingfisher, uh, which is such a beautiful uh, bird, but very tiny. So uh, the people that like bird watching will know that it's such um, a, a, an enthusiastic feeling of catching one and photographing one and taking a good photo. They are also um, excellent prey catchers. The glossy ibis um, in Romanian. It's very strange. It has such 
such a completely different name. I have to tell you that I personally like the English um, the English bird names because they are much easier to remember and not as random. You would tell that this is an ibis and it has beautifully cover, uh, colored feathers that you can only see in these colors, of course, in the sunlight. Because this, there's no, if there's no sunlight um, directly on it, it will just look like a blackbird. Uh, an endangered species um, normally found in the Danube Delta is the white-tailed vulture as well, with its catch and its uh, claws. And of course, the more common ones would be the great egret or the small egret. The difference between them will be their size and the color of their beak. The cormorants are very, very um, spread out. And the purple herons, one of the more elegant birds of the Danube Delta. And of course, if you're lucky, you get to see this colored pentacle. Uh, it's also a bird watcher's um, favorite. Um, it's such an exciting moment whenever they, they get to, to shoot one. It's, it's rare. Moving on, um, so you have passed the canals, you're um, um, watching as many birds as you can and uh, the guide tells you pretty much everything you want to know about these types of birds and you are moving on towards a village in uh, located deep in the Danube Delta. It's a fisherman's village is called Mila 23 and it can only be reached by boat. So let's see this. Just one second because this video has... I'd rather you just enjoy the video itself. Just It'll make you feel like you're riding the boat and you are actually in the Danube Delta. It is common to see covered boats in the Delta as well. These are privately owned. Uh, people will do uh, bird watching tours with cover boats as well, but we never do that. So um, we believe the experience is in seeing as much as possible. And it's better to just choose a day um, because during where the, when the weather is good. Um, but even if it rains, it's still not too bad because you're, you're doing summertime and the weather is, is not too bad. Boat ride uh, in the Danube Delta is just a leisurely activity. It's supposed to be relaxing. You're supposed to just wind down, um, get connected to nature. It is a fully natural experience, apart from the boat that you're in. But of course, if you want to, um, if you want a little, uh, a little extra adventure, you can always just take kayaks or boats that have no engines. These are typical fishermen houses. covered in weed. Most of the houses in the Danube Delta, but we'll speak about this later, use the weed that is naturally found in the area. Of course, it's one of the regions in, in Europe, the largest weed covered regions in Europe. Houses are built directly on the water or in, on the marshlands. Of course, sometimes they need rebuilding every couple of years. But these canals are um, generally protected from bad weather because of the of the vegetation and the trees all over. So this is for you just to get an idea of how the Danube Delta looks from above and how easy it is to get lost. So if you ever plan to come to, to visit the Danube Delta, always, I cannot stress this enough, always hire a local guide that's from the area and that knows the region really, really well because it will definitely pay off. You do not want to get lost in these canals. It's easy, very easy to get lost. 
So I um, I was speaking earlier about Mila 23 Village. That will be the, one of the stops during the boat ride. We don't want to uh, ride for eight hours straight. Of course, we will have stops. And this is um, the small village that we it's it's a regular stop in our in our tour. Um, as I've mentioned, it's built directly on the water on marshlands, and it has 450 inhabitants. Most of them are Lipovans. We will talk about them later. They are of Russian descendants. They are a minority here in Romania. Let's see uh, a video of them dancing and in uh, national costumes. Can you hear the, the music fine? Perfect. Very cheerful. So the Lipovans actually immigrated from Russia in the 18th century. They were dissenters from the main Russian Orthodox Church. They wanted to get away and they settled along the Prut River. Um, it's the main river in Moldavia, which is today a country in its own, but it used to be part of Moldova, the region that's part of Romania today, and in the Danube Delta. Um, it is they are still spread out in some uh, villages all throughout um, the Danube Delta, but Mila 23 village and another one that we're going to talk about later is uh, one of the more the more popular location to see them and to watch their culture. Uh, in order to construct their homes, the Lipovans, they create islets of dry land by digging up the mud from the trenches and they make a series of canals. So these are all uh, houses from Mila 23 that are built by the Lipovans. The house walls are made of reed and mud. So I don't know if you've ever, if you know how a clay house is built like, but you normally need to put in between the clay, um, either hay, they put reed, it's stronger. Um, and the thatching is standard for roofing. Um, if, well, here we have an example of a more modern roof, <laughs> but these are all traditional. Uh, because of the correct characteristics of these materials, the buildings have a tendency to sink into the mud and they need to be rebuilt every couple of years, um, as I've mentioned earlier. One character, one um, person that I want to mention here, one um, important Romanian from our history, by his name, Ivan Patsaikin, was born here in Mila 23. He um, is a Romanian canoe racing coach and he's a retired sprint canoeist. He took part in all of the major competitions between 1968 and 1984, including five consecutive Olympics. He won seven Olympic and 22 world championship medals, including four Olympic medals. This makes him the most decorated canoeist of all times, Romanian canoeist of all times. Um, and he is of a Russian descendant from a Lipovan family. Um, these are photos from his younger days, of course. And this is him today. Uh, I would like to share a story from, uh, from one of the um, Olympics that he participated in. In 1972, his oar actually broke. Um, but he wanted to finish the race because he didn't want to get disqualified. So what he did, he took a piece of wood from his canoe replaced the broken oar, and then that's how he finished the race. Uh, fortunately, he uh, was included in the repechage. Repes <laughs> uh, that's um, it's a technical term. That means that if you finish the race, you will be considered for the, uh, the next race. Um, you will be given a second chance to participate in the, in the normal race again. So he won that, he participated in the final race and uh, he managed to finish second, just by 0.03 seconds behind the winner. Uh, he is today 
one of the one of the biggest ambassadors for the Danube Delta and for sustainable tourism. We really, really like him and we like what he does. He needs to fight a lot of corruption, I have to admit, in the Danube Delta because a lot of people um, want to buy land, overfish, you know, how these things go. But we have him to um, push the goods further. Um, Another important aspect of this area in the Danube is the Pontic Shad. Um, the Shad, I think, is similar to the mackerel. Um, that would be a synonym. But this specific species is only located here in the Black Sea, and it migrates to the Danube every spring to um, reproduce. These are fishermen. So traditional fishermen from the Danube Delta, they use traditional Method and methods to fish, and um, these are all just Pontic shads that they caught. Why is this important? Uh, this comes from a protected geographical area, and it's um, a typical food from this area that has been recognized by the European Union. Uh, you, um, there's a process. So first of all, of course, you got the fish, you hang it for it to dry, you put salt on it. Um, afterwards, it goes through a cold smoking process, and that's part of it being a traditional food because that's how it used to be done uh, by the Lipovans. And the cold smoking, that means that the smoke has to uh, reach a temperature of maximum 24 degrees Celsius. So no more than that because the heat would actually destroy the meat. Uh, the Pontic Shad is known as one of the healthiest types of fish. It has 20% um, 20, a, a, per, a percentage of 20% fat in its body. So people say that it's good for your cholesterol, it cleans your arteries. Of course, it depends on how you eat it, if you ask me. Um, and well, thankfully in the Delta, people just like it thrown on the grill, as you see here. A typical breakfast would be to have a smoked uh, shad in the morning and maybe some fish roe maybe some marinated chunks of fish, maybe some fish meatballs, all served up with our favorite red onion. I know we are going to talk a lot about fish um, and I'm so sorry for those of you that did not enjoy fish. Um, don't worry, if you, you can still come to the Danube Delta and not have fish, of course, everyone serves all types of food, um, but for the purpose of showing them what typical foods are from this area, we have focused mostly on fish dishes. Um, after stopping in Mila 23 village, we leave again, we start riding the canals once again because we have another objective to, to reach and that will be Leta Forest. Let's see this aerial. where we left off uh, the other video on top of the Danube Delta and then we'll start going down again to see the most northern subtropical forest in Europe which can only be reached by boat. It's a um, atypical forest, it's unique to this area, it's not found anywhere else on Romanian territory and it's also pretty rare for Europe as well. Um, it's formed from trees like white poplar, black poplar, elm tree, English oak, um, common antler, just ash tree, and oh, the forest is um, completely um, growing in sand, so it's surrounded by fine white sand. It has a great diversity of um, subshrub species as well, and it's home to um, Like the, um, the, the viper, the, the virgin viper, the Danube Delta forest that you see here. The main attraction of this forest are the wild horses. And another aspect of its diversity is that more than 1,600 species of insects have been identified here in this reservation. You can see here, this is all sand. I know it looks like dirt, but it's sand. Music a little bit lower.
So we were talking about Leta Forest and the wild horses. Um, this forest is only reached by boat. You arrive in this village, which is called Leta Village, of course, and you normally go on a safari ride. But of course, the safaris in Romania are not jeeps. And um, I mean, they can be a four by four car. But if you want to go the traditional way, we suggest just a horse carriage ride. Uh, as you can see, they are ready to shoot some uh, birds or some types of uh, animals. And um, Leta village is actually really, really pretty. Uh, these are typical houses, white, uh, white walls. The blue, the color blue is um, typical of constructions in the Danube Delta, of course. It's spe specifically this shade of blue. And I'm looking here above me. It's a very old instrument of fishing. Um, not only shad, different types of, of fish from the Danube Delta. It's hanging here from the restaurant where we're gonna eat uh, during today, during the day. So the boat ride, when we stop for lunch, uh, this is the place where we're eating and they serve traditional Leka food. So as I was saying, the sand, the white fine sand and the forest all around it. And the wild horses that everyone uh, visits in the Danube Delta do all, oh, they want, they want to go and see the wild horses. Um, I have to admit, they are not wild in the typical sense. Um, they were just former domest domestic horses who, uh, which have been let go by their owners because the owners couldn't take care of them anymore. Uh, however, today they are a great touristic attraction. Um, they're very beautiful. They are in great numbers and they're thriving in the area and a brand of wine um, from this region. This region is known for its um, vineyards. And there's a brand of wine, which is called Cai de la Leta, which means Leta horses. Uh, I have chosen a rosé, but of course they do have whites and uh, reds as well. And we have reached the end of the night after our boat ride. Of course, you deserve to rest in a very beautiful guest house. And the guest house that we're typically sleeping in, of course, has to be traditional. Uh, this would be the inside of your room. And please notice the bed. The bed has a very interesting feature. Um, it's this little door right here. You see this big chunk of wood next to the bed. So yes, if you're cold at night, you're just gonna prepare a, um, a fire underneath your bed. That's how they used to keep warm. These houses made of clay, of course they don't have, because the, the roof is reed, they um, needed to avoid any fire hazards. So this was a typical way to, to get warm. Notice the beautifully painted furniture and of course the decorative rugs hanging from the walls. This would be the outside of the guest house. Uh, my personal favorites um, are the, um, the roofs and the eyes on the roofs. So Romania, you know, it's known for um, the spy houses because even in Transylvania, the Saxons built those houses. If you've seen our tours before and especially photos from Sibiu, you have a feeling that the, the houses are watching you. The same feature we find in the Danube Delta, but of course the eyes are wider and they look uh, not as... Um, you know, not, not, not like a spy, they just look like a mild version of, of the Transylvanian ones. Um, and the, um, the houses, as I said, the color blue, um, found also in the, in the covers, the window covers, and all sorts of symbols specific to, um, to the Black Sea region, the fish, and of course, the grapes. And the amphora, because I did not mention what Dobroja is, its complexity and biodiversity is due to the fact that it was constantly um, home to different civilizations. It started off with the Greeks back in ancient times, then it was um, a part of the Roman, the Romans came after the Greeks, and then it was um, at some point part of the Ottoman Empire, it was completely engulfed. It is the only region in Romania that was under complete control of the Ottoman Empire. So all of these influences are seen in what uh, the region is today. It's the more, the density of minorities is higher here than in not any other place in Romania. And of course, the influences um, can be seen too. So 
Uh, we finished our third day in Tulcha, off in, in this guest house. You are rested and ready for day four. Day four will go on St. George Branch. And this time we are going deep into the, into the Danube Delta. We are reaching St. George Branch by boat and only by boat. And that's where we're going to sleep. Let's see a video of how the branch looks like. This is the oldest branch of the Danube as it flows into, into the Black Sea. Its first mention in a, an international map happened in the year 1313, so back in medieval times. Today, it only has one village and it has a population of 800 inhabitants. Unfortunately, it is dropping. Um, year by year. So people uh, are normally there just for the touristic season and the 800 inhabitants um, are definitely um, an aging population. It is known for its pristine beaches. Uh, the beaches are all located in this area. So the St. George Branch Canal the fresh water flows into the Black Sea. This is all brackish water and the beach is, is beautiful and wide. Also in uh, next to St. George, um, another piece of earth has formed. It's called Sakhalin Island. It's actually the newest land in Europe. It's constantly changing. And I have a video to show um, how it's formed and how it looks. It's right off the coast um off went to uh, St. George branch and it was initially made up of two different islands um however it merged into a continuing landmass it's a big bird paradise it's strictly protected because of this because it is a bird paradise um you will find here especially great white pelicans seagulls but also different other types of birds and if you if <laughs> if you want to match maps this the strip of land is constantly, constantly changing because it's formed out of sand that the water brings in, that the sea brings in, that the Danube brings in. And of course, it's shaped, as you can see from, um, from how it looks, by the wind. So, it, you know, it has the, that rounded shapes um, because of the wind, because it's out in the open, no, no forests around it. Uh, a great... Uh, one objective that if we go to Sakhalin Island, uh, we have to take a very, very slow boat. It's highly regulated and sometimes we're not even allowed to go. Um, but off the Sakhalin Island, you can see a shipwreck. It's called Tusla Ship Shipwreck. And today we call it the Cormorant Hotel because you, you know, all the blackbirds that you see uh, everywhere on the, on the ship are all cormorants, so no other species. Um, and the white, <laughs> the white on top of the of the ship, it's their hoop, uh, which is slowly corroding the um, the boat. Unfortunately, it's highly corrosive, um, but it is it is beautiful. And its story is a little bit disheartening because um, they say that the people that brought this ship here back in the 1980s, so it's not a very old shipwreck. Um, they got stuck in the sand from the Sakhalin Island, the new sand. Locals, they wanted, they went there, they wanted to help the, the sailors, the unexperienced sailors. Uh, but the sailors um, said, no, thank you. And they said, no, no, we'll be able to get out of the, of the sand. Unfortunately, they didn't know the, um, the way the Sakhalin Island and this new land uh, goes. The locals looked at them if you don't get help soon, you will get stuck forever, and they did. So that's why this, this, this ship actually uh, was almost brand new at the moment it happened. So, um, And in St. George, uh, St. George Village is home to another minority. This time, uh, so we've seen the Lipovins that come from Russia. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Eastern influence here in, in Dobroja as well. We have the Ukrainian minority. In Romanian, they call themselves Hahol. Uh, it's a very, very, very tiny community. Not a lot of Romanians know about them either or this uh, name. And they are um, descendants of the Cossacks. They are the ones that um, took shelter here. They were part of the troops of 
um, Catherine II, and um, they had to fight their way into gaining land in the Danube Delta starting in the 18th century. Their traditional language is Ukrainian, but they have words mixed up from Romanian, from Turkish, um, or from Greek. Um, there's the Greek influence, obviously the ancient influence, and also the Turkish from the time that the, um, um, this region was part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they have very colorful uh, traditional costumes as well. And the ladies, the lovely ladies that you're looking at are actually part of the chorus that sings if you, uh, if you wanna listen to them singing when you're visiting there. The people from St. George, they are fishermen, of course, uh, but sturgeon is very, well, was very important in this area. Right now it's strictly protected. You can only get sturgeon uh, from um, fisheries, uh, which are also in, located in the Danube Delta, but um, they're strictly protected because the sturgeon populations has gone down, population has gone down when the Iron Gates Dam was built by the Danube boi boilers where the Danube enters in Serbia. Um, so unfortunately, because they couldn't move around to um, reproduce, their population decreased um, dramatically. This is a photo from the beginning of the century, so before of the dam. This would be the size of the fish that the fishermen and uh, the Ukrainian fishermen would catch here in this area. Uh, they were specifically known for fishing beluga sturgeon, which is known for its uh, caviar. And of course, this village was um, quite rich at the time because of its commerce with, with caviar. A lot of Greek um, businessmen came in this area too. Uh, today they are known for a typical soup called storchag. This is a Romanian name. It's sturgeon soup. Um, the version that is called storchag has to be made only with sturgeon meat. That's the traditional way. Of course, there's plenty of different types of fish soup today in that uh, in, in different villages from, uh, from Dobroja. Uh, they could use carp, they could use a pretty much a, all, like um, all types of fish that they can think of. And um, it's done in this big, big uh, bowl outside. You use lots of vegetables like carrots, onions, um, bell peppers, whatever, and uh, potatoes, and big, big chunks of fish. So the fish typically goes inside full. And when I say full, I mean everything. Organs, um, intestines, head, all that's put inside the, the, the soup. Um, and another way of doing this traditionally is to use water straight from the Danube which is boiled, of course. Uh, so at the, end of the, at the end of preparing, it should be fine for, for eating. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't tried the, the traditional Danube Delta water, or maybe I have and they just didn't want to tell me. But the way to, to eat, of course, it's, um, you put sour cream at the end, a little bit of um, parsley, and it's good to serve. It's served with polenta. And you take out the pieces of fish, you eat the fish separately with polenta with a little bit of, of, um, of the soup and the, um, the soup with the vegetables separately. It can be very, very good. Vlad is um, much more in love with the soup than I am, but it was like 10 years ago that I've tried it and I really, really enjoyed it, but never since. So I don't know. Um, and on our fourth day in, um, in St. George, there's a resort that we like a lot. It's called Green, Green Village. Uh, they are known for their sustainable tourism ways and um, activities. And they encourage tourists to be um, travelers, slow travelers, and to experience more, not, um, not go for the mass types of tourism. And they've prepared the, um, a clip for this village and what they offer. So I want to share it with you. It starts with Sakhalin Island, of course, with the birds that you can see in the Danube Delta. The boat that I told, that I uh, talked to you about. Sorry, there's no sound, right? The 
the great white pelicans, the horses. And this would be the resort. So they have traditionally um, thatched roof houses. They use local materials in uh, the way they built. As you can see, everything is wood inside. It's a great atmosphere. So it calls for relaxation. We like that place for um, what it offers, for the peace that it offers, for the fact that it's very close to the beach and you, it's walking distance and you get to watch incredible sunsets from there. And of course, it's close to the village as well. So um, you can always mingle with the locals and um, talk to them and find the fishermen stories, of course. So St. George is actually an incredible place in Romania, and I specifically like it because it's the place where the Danube enters the Black Sea and they all merge together beautifully. After our day in St. George, we go back towards the land. Uh, we leave St. George also by a boat ride, and we arrive in Jurilovka. Jurilovka is a Lipovan village. Uh, the Lipovans are the Russian minority that we talked about earlier. And let's see an aerial of this village. This village was founded at the beginning of the 19th century. It started off as a very small village, but it quickly became an important fishing center in the Danube Delta. And today it has the biggest fisherman community in the whole of Romania. It has one of the most modern fish processing factories in the country in East, Eastern Europe. It's a pleasure to just walk around the village. So there's no, no way you can get bored just by watching the houses. This is the soup that I talked to you about and the big chunks of fish that you can find inside. And this video is actually done um, um, by a YouTube channel. It's called Lipo Venesk. You can see it here um, in the lower corner. Lipo Venesk means, uh, comes from Lipovans. So it's of their um, descendants, of their minority. And they do a great job in promoting their village and all of the communities located in the Danube Delta of, that are part of this community. Uh, some more traditional costumes. Unfortunately, uh, I did mention aging population. There is a small number of youth coming back and trying to revive their parents' ways and traditions, which only makes us happier because that means uh, that their tradition will not go extinct, which unfortunately a lot of the minorities here are facing. And um, activities that you can do in Jurilovka that we normally go for while, while we are in the area is to just go on a canoe, on a boat ride, or kayaks, or just simply bicycle rides. As you can see, um, there's a beach close by that you can enjoy. The legendary sunsets are amazing from a kayak. And if you're tired of kayaks, of uh, water, or birds, or you want to see something else for the historic in you, we have another proposal, and that will be to visit Argamum Fortress. It's one of the many fortresses found in the Danube Delta. There's a lot, a lot of them, and what you see is just the surface. 90% of it, it's underneath the earth, and they actually do not want to unearth it just to preserve it. Um, there are a couple of um, fortresses that have been uncovered, like Histria, and the, the process of decaying is much, much faster once you start receiving tourists. So let's see a video. The fortress is located on top of a, of a cape. It's called Dolosman Cape. Uh, cape. Um, it's the only area in Romania that looks like this, like with a very steep uh, rock right, um, right by the edge of the, of the sea. You see the fortress, but you see the outline. It's all around it.
It is the oldest known settlement on Romanian territory. It dates from the beginning of the 6th century. And it was established by the first Greek colonists that came here from Asia Minor. It had a different name in Greek. Uh, Argamum is its Roman name uh, because the Romans came in the first century um, after Christ. They came here and they took over. And some people say, uh, if you know the legend of the Argonauts of Jason in search of the golden wool, um, that some people say that they have stopped. This is one of their uh, stops on their way back to, to, to Greece. Uh, I have to say the video does not make it justice. Uh, seeing it in real life is so much beautiful. And another curiosity from here, if you walk on the shore of this, of this cape, you are bound to find ancient pieces of ceramics. So when we went there, we found lots and lots of pottery. Of course, it was all broken down, pottery pieces from their day-to-day -day use uh, pots and pans, so to say. Um, there are so, so many that they have lost their historical importance. But of course, um, it still makes you feel excited when you find a piece of ceramics that was made, you know, 2000 years ago. So um, yeah, it's your chance to find a piece of ancient history. Um, back to Flora this time, I have to mention the wild ponies find, uh, found here in um, very close to Zhidlovka is called Babadag Forest. They are strictly protected. They are, um, they are an endemic species from this area. Um, and it actually has um, a legend. Um, they say the, the, so the name in Latin is Ponia Peregrina. And they say that it was a doctor by this name, Pion. He was the one that uh, upset some gods. And of course, the gods uh, punished him with death. Uh, because he didn't have an alternative other than to die, he transformed himself into a wild pony. Uh, and they, people consider that the ponies are um, healing plants. Um, fortunately for the doctor, uh, the ponies were used to save uh, the gods Pluto and Mars after one war that they had, and um, he regained the sympathy of the gods once more. So he um, was turned into a doctor once again. Well, leaving all legends aside, the ponies are known for its healing properties, even um, from, from Roman times. Um, they say that it cures a lot of diseases. Of course, this aspect of um, the healing um, part of these flowers are lost to the general knowledge. It's only the locals that know some of these ways. And um, I wanted to point out a very, very beautiful um, guest house in the area. It was recently um, restored in the past couple of years um, by um, um, a guy in our generation. He just went there, uh, took an old um, decaying house from his uh, family and restored it to all of, the, um, all of the requirements of comfortable modern accommodations. Of course, he used uh, the blue shade, the shade of blue that the region is known for, restored beautifully the woodwork and the roof. And this is how it looks inside. So all the comforts of modern age, but, you know, it still feels, it's still part of uh, the authenticity of what the area has to offer. So we like to, to um, use this place as um, um, one of the accommodations that we offer during the tour. Everything was done specifically and was painted handmade as much as possible in, uh, during the process of restoration of this place. And we have come to the end of our fifth day and the beginning of our sixth day, uh, one day apart from uh, the finish of our tour. And this time we are visiting another fortress. You cannot leave the Danube Delta without seeing any sala. Um, the fortress doesn't look like much when you look at it from the first moment. Um, it is in ruins, um, only one tower survives, but once you're on top, because it's located on top of a hill, you have an amazing, an amazing view, panoramic view of all 
the surrounding um, villages and region. It's, this hill is actually a calcareous hill and the fortress itself was built in the second half of the 14th century. Um, for military purposes, they say that it was built by some Genovese merchants, which were owners of, um, or part of the monopole over the Black Sea navigation. Um, a lot of its history is unknown. It has an irregular polygonal plane, which uh, follows the land closely. So it goes after the hill that it's built on. It was integrated uh, during the reign of Mircea the Old, which is uh, one of our more important rulers from Valachia. If you've been following us for quite some time, you should know where Valachia is. It used to be the southern region of, uh, of Romania, and it was abandoned after the Turkish domination of Dobroja. Um, it hasn't been used for quite hun for hundreds of years, so it was it had a very brief period of time when it was in use. That's why it's in this state today. But it's known for its amazing, amazing sunsets. Uh, as I told you, from that hill you get to see everything all the way until the water and all the the, uh, the places around it. From Enisala, there's a couple of expeditions and we can go, depending on your, uh, on your needs, depending on what you like to do in the Danube Delta, we can suggest different things. But the one that I chose for you for the group tour would be an expedition on a boat this time. So Zhurilovka is the village that we talked about earlier. And you go all the way to Gura Portice. This is a natural reserve. Um, it's a strip of beach. Um, I would like to say pristine, but it's not as pristine lately because it, it, it grew in popularity, but it's still a very, very beautiful area. This whole area is uh, where the Black Sea meets the waters of the Danube and some lakes have formed. And then we're going back to Doloshman Cape, the one that we saw earlier where the Argamum uh, Fortress is, and back to Zhurilovka. Um, there's a company that we normally use. It's called Juri Lotka. This is um, a wordplay. Juri Lotka. Lotka is actually a Romanian name for this type of boat. So this really wide boat that you still need to use oars for. Um, and it incorporated in the Juri Lotka, the name of the, of the village. And behind it, it's Doloshman Cape. Or of course, if, uh, if you like bicycles, we can always go uh, on a bicycle ride up on the Cape and just watch the water around. And the guest house that we, um, the accommodation that we normally choose when in Enisala, it's a beautiful place called Enisala Safari Village. Uh, they like this word safari here. I know it's not your typical safari that you associate with, with um, African um, tours, um, <clears throat> but they call it safari because of the expeditions that they, that they normally do. Traditional houses, once more, uh, notice the reed uh, roofs, the colors. This would be a typical um, house with, um, with rooms inside, offers all the comforts. And this is the rotonda or their um, lounge area, so to say. And this is how the lounge area looks inside. Everyone eats. It's a very, very, very long table. It's a communal table where all the guests eat and they provide all the meals. So we normally have the dinner here. They have the most amazing cooks that I have ever met. And for a person that doesn't like fish and especially carp, uh, I have had the best carp, the Danubian, the best Danubian carp uh, here in this place. So do let me know in the chat if you know what carp is, if you've ever tried it. And um, if you agree with me that carp can be mm, not, not the best fish. And day six comes to an end, unfortunately, uh, with us checking out of Enisala Safari Village. And we, are, we have one more, um, one more city before we have to turn back to Bucharest, and that will be Constanza. We can leave uh, the Danube Delta and Dobroja without seeing Constanza as well. It's a city by the shores of the Black Sea. It is the oldest continuously inhabited city in Romania uh, for more than 2,000 years. I have included its Greek name here, 
Tomis because you'll see it everywhere, everywhere. It's commonly used and it's the biggest port city that we have in Romania. All the commercial um, ships that come in and out, uh, the, their biggest number comes through Constanza. Uh, we are not going to go into a lot of details about Constanza. What we normally do, because we will arrive there in the morning, we will go on a walking tour of its old town. Constanza is uh, also, it embodies the Danube Delta and Dobroja in a much smaller scale. So you uh, can find all of the minorities in this city, all of their um, cultural and food um, diversity here. And one of its most iconic landmarks has to be the casino. Um, it was um, completed between the First and the Second World War. It was built in Art Nouveau style. Um, it, you know, it features some chess architecture, a wonderful view of the sea, but unfortunately for us, it's in decay. This is an old photo of the casino. Uh, the pedestrian area, it's a sought after, it used to be a sought after destination for couples and families, especially at sunset, and it still is today. And uh, the casino was actually built to see how many people gather, and they still gather there today. It's a, it's a lovely boardwalk, and it's a lovely uh, walk to do um, in the afternoon and the evening. Um, it was built in three separate times. The first structure was um, erected in wood in the 1880. It was designed to be a club and a community center for the elite and upper class socialites, of course, willing to spend their cash. Um, notice the way the people are dressed around here. And it was once considered to be Romania's Monte Carlo. It was a symbol of the city of Constanza. Uh, the most modern um, version of the casino was in operation for 38 years, was interrupted by the Second World War, attacked, it was bombed uh, by German troops. And um, at one point it was also a wartime hospital. Um, in the 1948, when Romania uh, started uh, being a communist country, it was taken over by the communist government and it became a house of culture. Um, the building remained closed since 1990s. This is a, um, a newer photo of the casino and how it looks today. The last major repairs of the building took place in 1988, so that's more than 30 years ago, you can imagine. A building without um, any work done, any maintenance done, just falls into decay. And it's beautiful architecture on the inside. Um, it's starting to fall apart slowly. But fortunately, in the recent years, uh, they have started a rehabilitation project. So in the coming years, we will see the restored casino, hopefully. Um, I have mentioned minorities living here in, uh, in uh, Constanza. And I couldn't finish the tour without talking about the Turkish and the Tatar influence that, uh, that we have. There's a lot of mosques everywhere um, from the time of the Ottoman Empire. Actually, the hometown of Vlad is Mangalia. And um, in, that, um, in that town, you can find the oldest mosque in Romania. It's more than 500 years old. Old. Um, this is a representation of the Turkish minority and their beautifully colorful um, costumes. And the Tatar minority also in, um, in uh, traditional costumes. Both of them are of Turkish um, origin, both um, minorities. And this is just a photo. It's not a very good quality photo. I couldn't find a very good quality photos of all of them together. It's the Tatars, the Turkish community and the Romanian community in Constanza. The best part, the best part of uh, the minorities, of the Turkish and the Tatar minorities, um, has to be their cuisine. And of course, I am biased, uh, but they have amazing, amazing cuisine. The, uh, one, of, one of my favorite snack foods has to be shuberek and ayran. Shuberek is pretty much uh, fried dough filled. It can be filled with, um, if you want to go traditional, with lamb meat. Um, but you can go wild. Like I have seen them filled with chickens, with um, turkey, with even vegetables, but the best one would have to be lamb meat shuberek. Ayran, if you've never heard of it, uh, I know it's become more and more popular in the past few years, is yogurt, Turkish yogurt. Um, to a regular yogurt, they would add salt and a little bit of water and mint. It's amazing with mint. And this combination right here, just makes my mouth water. 
in the Turkish community, of course, they're known for their kebabs, for um, all sorts of savory dishes. But my favorite dessert, because we kept talking about savory dishes today, I haven't given you any dessert yet. We will finish off with something sweet, and that has to be the baklava. Uh, this is uh, pistachio baklava. It's um, do let me know if you've ever tried baklava before. I know it's quite popular now and it's found um, pretty much everywhere. It's very juicy uh, and nutty and um, you cannot have more than one or two pieces. Otherwise you'll die of a sugar coma, uh, but it's amazing. And it's one of my favorites. After we have lunch in Constanza, we get to try either a shubedek or a baklava or whatever you feel like. We go back to Bucharest. It's time to go back to Bucharest on the seventh day and to check in at the hotel because on day eight would have to be the departure day when you uh, depart Romania or if you want, you can go further and visit Transylvania. So I hope you enjoyed our tour of the Danube Delta. Uh, it was a pleasure to show you around the Danube Delta and Dobroja area is um, absolutely amazing, completely different than anything else you can find in Romania and in its other regions. And um, biodiverse, beautiful for bird watching and for um, the people that are passionate about uh, wildlife and wildlife watching, great opportunities to do this in a professional way if that's what you want. There are hides um, specifically designed for professionals, but of course this can also be done at an amateur um, in an amateur way as well. We do have the group tour dates for our uh, own Explore Danube Delta um, uh, tour next year. Um, and isn't it amazing? We, um, we have the tour on the 22nd of May and our tour is set to start next year on the 22nd of May and finish on the 29th of May, which is actually Vlad's birthday. So we get to celebrate together. So if you're interested in uh, this type of tour, do let us know and we can start the Q&A. I will invite Vlad over to join me in the Q&A as well. So don't be shy. Uh, I would love to get to know you and to talk to you. So if you have any questions, please um, go ahead. Early happy birthday to Vlad. Happy birthday. He is going to be 30 next week. So it's a very special birthday. It's a milestone. So do you countries seem to be opening up to non-essential travel, including tour? How do things look for your 2021 tour schedule? Um, it's okay. We have had a lot of tours canceling, um, not because of the people. Um, they were vaccinated. They were ready to come, but because they tied their travel to another Part of Europe, which is only natural, you don't travel all the way from the United States to Europe just to see one uh, one thing. So, um, because the, um, either the cruise company or the plane company or um, what one type of company, they canceled their travel. So they got their cruise ships canceled. They got their plane tickets canceled. They also canceled um, our, I'm not canceled, they postponed our tour. They uh, said that they will come back in 2022. So part of the tours have been postponed for 2022. Uh, part of them will go on as planned and it's especially the private tours that will go on as planned because the people, um, as I said, they are vaccinated, they're ready to go travel to Romania and to all of Europe will open as long as you have the vaccine or proof that you have a negative test or um, if you've had COVID in the past and are healed and can prove that, um, that's also a, a good good to go into requirement, say for those that maybe cannot vaccinate or or so on. We're still open for our myths and legends for Halloween tour if you want to see Brancaster for Halloween. Or if you want to see the Danube Delta, the best times of the year to see the Danube Delta are May and September. That's when the birds come in or the birds come out. Um, anytime between that, the weather uh, becomes a little bit hotter. And during the day, it's much harder to spot birds because they also like to hide away from the heat. Uh, I do have another poll. And that has to be 
about your favorite dish today. So from what we so from what I've talked about, do vote in. What's your favorite? What was your favorite looking? Favorite looking, of course, because you cannot know how it tastes like so far. Of course, sugar wins all the time. Sugar wins. Yep, baklava. Yep, it's great. And I, I have a feeling that it won only because um, most of you know it already or probably have tried it um, apart from the other types of dishes. But we want to share a traditional um, baklava recipe from, uh, from uh, Dobroja um, to those of you that have participated to this tour. So I will stop this poll and yeah if you have any more questions do connect with me you can unmute yourself show yourself i love to um talk i'd love to talk to you oh i'm so sorry to hear that susan yeah i don't know if they can make baklava with gluten-free flour but maybe we can try. We can, maybe I can find the recipe for that. I can look it up. Thank you so much, Ivona. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Of course, as you know, these tours are free. Of course, we want to put forward um, the best things that we have to offer. We put a lot of um, a lot of our time um, into researching these tours as best to the best of our abilities. If you feel inclined to offer a donation, I have put this screenshot here. Um, different ways to do so, either PayPal for the European travelers, um, it's, a, it's a bank that we use, Revolut, or you can become our Patreon. We have a Patreon uh, as of lately. Um, it's more of a subscription-based type of support. Uh, the, um, the smallest tier starts at $5 and you get to uh, receive a physical postcard from us in, and written by us. And of course, there are many other benefits. Uh, just by signing in here, you get to know them. There's um, um, other um, other tiers available too. Let's see. Bon soirée. Bon soirée, Paul. Thank you again for, for joining us tonight and for uh, watching our tours. Vlad has also prepared the quiz for everyone. Woody is one of our Patreons. He um, has been amazing. Um, he is a great Romanian supporter and we love him for that. And we can't uh, wait to, to see you here as well. Vlad has shared the, the poll, the quiz again, sorry. And if there are no more questions, um, I have to say good night. Um, or have a great evening for those of you from um, from uh, the United States or from a different time zone. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Um, I will be sharing our future free virtual tours for the uh, for the rest of the season in the coming um, in the coming weeks. Um, it'll probably be shared either through our regular newsletter or just send you um, a separate email to this um, to this. Um, related to this tour. So thank you again for, for watching us and thank you for participating today. And if you ever have any other questions, please do let us know. La revedere. Thank you so much. Have a good night.